time God gives no words in the process. It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. If we name our sins to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning this portion of the Word we note and assemble it into our souls and categorize it appropriately so that we can grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Evil is the policy of Satan. The policy of God is grace. What is grace? Grace is all that God is free to do for mankind. It's what he's done for us. What is evil? Well, that's the policy of Satan. Usually it's what we can do for ourselves. And he is the ruler of this world. Evil is the policy of Satan as the ruler of this world. Evil is the modus operandi of Satan. From the time of his fall, from the time he said, I'll be like the Most High God, throughout the angelic revolution, and down to this very time, when he is now the ruler of the world, his policy has been evil. Good and evil. Thou shalt not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Evil is Satan's failure to produce a system of good in mankind and society that would bring the millennium. Evil is Satan's failure to produce a system of good in mankind and society that would bring about a pseudo-millennium, a false millennium, a counterfeit millennium. What is Satan's policy right now? He wishes to produce a counter-millennium or a counterfeit millennium. What he's saying is, well, I'll be like Jesus Christ in which it is prophesied that Jesus Christ will produce a millennium, he says to himself, well, I'll be like the Most High God. I myself will produce a millennium. But he's arrogant. He's in over his head and he can't do it. It reminds me of a lot of people who think they can do stuff they can't do. They do not understand their limits. And people who do not understand their limitations are arrogant people. You have to understand your limitations in life. And you have to understand when you're getting in over your head. Satan didn't understand that. Satan said, I'll be like the Most High God. As soon as he said that, he was in over his head. Now he had been promoted to the highest rank of any creature ever, ever. Satan. The most beautiful creature ever. The most beautiful voice ever. He had been promoted by God upon his creation to the highest position ever. But he wanted more. How many people are like that? A lot of people because they're in his system. And they follow him. And they want more and more and more. And some people think they need to be in this position or that position. Sometimes they get promoted to that position simply because of their personality. You see what happens to a person who has inordinate competition and inordinate ambition. A stupid person in authority will look down. A stupid person in authority, for example, in the authority of a company, will look at this person with inordinate ambition and say, well, this person's a go-getter. This person is somebody who's really uh, going to do something for this company. Therefore, promotion will come on his head. It's a satanic promotion. Satan doesn't personally know about it, but it's a promotion in his system because what they're saying is because of his excessive ambition, he will be promoted. Because he's already throwing his weight around and acting like the boss, maybe he'd be a good boss. Wrong! Humility makes the best bosses. But oftentimes people get promoted in the cosmic system because they have no humility and they're already acting like boss. 
So they say, well, since they're already acting that way, maybe that'd be a good position for them. Stupid thinking. Satanic thinking. And it's not a good position. You, first of all, you have to know how to act under authority. Anyone who's trying to be boss to me, I would say you are not capable of running anything. You're getting in over your head. And too many people want to be the king of the show. They have a, uh, not an inferiority complex, but a superiority complex. And a superiority complex oftentimes gets promoted. An inferiority complex rarely does, of course. And those in the divine dynasphere, they get promoted in God's timing. So evil is the policy of Satan as the ruler of the world. And evil is Satan's system by which he administers the rulership of this world. And Satan cannot restrain sin. Don't think he doesn't try, but he can't. Satan cannot restrain sin. Therefore, he has another side to the coin. He cannot restrain sin. He cannot restrain evil. So there's another side to his coin. Good. Good. And he parlays human good into sin and evil. Satan does. Satan parlays human good into sin and evil. But uh, human good in itself is already evil. So all evil has two sources. Evil has two sources. Sin and erroneous thinking combined with human good. Sin combined with human good. Human good is the motivation of evil. Where there is sin of self-righteousness, where is the sin where there is the sin of self-righteousness plus human good or and sincerity there is saturation of evil in a nation and that's what we have human good sincerity you know when people go to vote what do they look for well which candidate looks the most sincere we've had presidents who could look very sincere they're called actors good actors and very sincere looking but that's human good and where there's a sin of self-righteousness plus human good and sincerity, there's a saturation of evil. And where is most evil saturated today? In legalistic churches, which includes most of them. 99% of them. Legalistic churches. And there's a saturation of human good. I'm good because I don't do this. I'm good because I do this. good has nothing to do with it. You see, the real question in Christianity after you believe in Christ is this. Now what? And in most churches, if you went to the pastor and said, I believed in Christ, now what? Do you know what he'll say? Be good, brother. Be good. Oh, they'll, they'll use other teams, Terry, or terms, Terry, etc. Don't know what Terry means, but uh, be good. Cause that's the big, just be good. Be good? That's part of Satan's system in terms of the fact that Adam and Eve ate from the knowledge of good and evil. They didn't need good. Adam and Eve never needed to be good. That's not part of God's system. God's system for us is spirituality. Not good, but spirituality. Now under spirituality you produce divine good good of intrinsic value oftentimes it goes unnoticed human good is always noticed people pat you on the back most pastors who give up and give a sermon after somebody's dead talks about all the human good that person did what an insult it's an insult really this person's dead and now you bring up their human good might as well bring up their sins too and their evil it's all the same Human good and evil, the same. So they bring up all the human good he gave to the poor. He did this and he did that. He was a shining star in our community. It is such a terrible loss that we have. But he was so good, my fellow brethren, that God had to take him home. He was so good that God couldn't leave him here on this pathetic earth any longer. He was so good that God needed him to himself. And boy, do we miss all the good he produced. 
Now let's pray. And then they pray. Where's the gospel? You know what it is? Satanic gospel. Be good and be saved. And I've seen the most disgusting funerals where people would say he was such a good... Some guy got up. This man, he was such a good man. And he got emotional. Made everybody else emotional. Crying and all that. He was such a good man. And the only thing I ever wanted to do was be like my grandfather. He was such a good man. Now everybody, I want everybody, if you want to be saved, come gather around the coffin of my dead uh, grandfather. He didn't put it in those terms, but come gather around the coffin. You think that brought salvation to anybody? No. Did people gather around the coffin? Yes. For what? Out of praise of a man. Not out of praise to God. Out of praise uh, to a man who had departed and had performed a lot of human good. So what? Human good was in the Garden of Eden. And they weren't to eat from it. They weren't to have a knowledge of good or evil. Why is it all wrapped up in one tree? Because it's all the same. Human good is evil and evil is human good. Human good and evil. And so a funeral is a place, by the way, where the gospel is to be given. Not to talk about how good someone was. Billy Graham said something very wonderful, uh, and you've heard this before, when Larry King asked him. He said, are you going to have an epigram on your tomb that talks about how good you were on this earth, etc.? He said, no, I'm going to have an epigram that talks about how good Jesus Christ was for me. Now that's perfect good. It's a difference. It's not human good. It's not satanic good. Perfect good. And that was a perfect answer. One of the few perfect answers he's given. But a good answer. Better than most could ever give. So all evil has two sources. Erroneous thinking and human good. Sin and human good. Sin and erroneous thinking and human good. So the principle is that if Satan, as the ruler of world, as the ruler of the world, is not capable of ruling the world he controls, then how can any man rule it? Once again, I know that came out weird. This is the principle. This is the principle. If Satan, as the ruler of the world, is not capable of ruling this world that he controls, if he's not capable of ruling it, then no man can rule it either. Principle. If Satan as the ruler of this world is not capable of ruling the world he controls, then no man can rule it either. There goes politics out the window for you. No man can rule this world Man cannot solve problems by human solutions. That includes human good and human evil. And that's all the world's trying to do today, including this client nation USA. We are trying to solve problems through human good. And evil. We've been doing it for years, and we're still a client nation, and that's grace. But after a while, the grace of God will have to administer punishment because he's perfect. Evil is the function and innovation of that person who is constant, consistently involved in the cosmic system. Again, evil is the function and innovation of that person who is constantly involved in the cosmic system. Innovation. What's that mean? Well, when you're under evil, you can come up with an innovation, brilliant innovations about how to solve the world's problems. Some of it would sound very, very good. You could sit around thinking all day, how do I solve this problem? I know there's a problem, there must be a solution. That's the right thought. But then apply it in the wrong way and use a satanic solution. How do you solve it? How would I solve it? Etc. And that all comes under the composite of Satan's super genius, by the way. As a super genius, Satan's always trying to solve the world's problems. 
and he uses his minions. They don't necessarily have to be geniuses, they just have to be human. And they can be believer or unbeliever, but once they fall under his system, they begin to believe of themselves as being smart. And they begin to believe of themselves as having human good solutions. And they do have human good solutions, but they're not adequate. They are satanic solutions. So evil is the function and innovation of that person who is in the cosmic system. Evil is the adverse trend of society. That's what we are under today. Evil in this country. It is the destruction of society. Evil will destroy society. It is the malfunction of society. It is the removal of legitimate authority and its function under category one truth. What's category one truth? The laws of divine establishment. Evil goes against the laws of divine establishment. Evil says do not execute. Evil says no war. And you say, well that sounds good. No war. It's what, well, sounds good. Human good. Good and evil. But it's not part of divine establishment. Divine establishment says prepare for war. There will be wars and rumors of wars until I come. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. And there will be. And the only thing a client nation can do is be prepared. And we are not. We are, we are so not prepared that the Iranian president's been running around saying, we're tied down and we aren't, we're too scared to do anything to them. So they're going to continue on their way. If I were president, as soon as he made them comments, I would have satellite positioned and found out where he was and killed him. As if we we have the power to do it. Believe me, we have the ability. We could wipe them out in a second. But they know something about us. We're full of human good and evil. And so we're not going to function in that way. Why not? Well, because that wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be proper. It wouldn't be good. And the whole world, we think, would look down on us. Mm -mm. They would look up to us. Finally, for once. Now they look down on us. That's why they can run around and make fun of us. Ha ha, you're bogged down in Iraq, which is a lie. We're not bogged down there. You're bogged down in Iraq. Ha ha, you can't bomb us. No, it just puts us closer to you. That's all. Besides, you don't have a nuke yet, and we've got lots of them. And we have this treaty we need to follow in which we need to get rid of some nukes, and I thought about using your country as a dumping ground. See, that's correct thinking. But people with human good say, oh, no, uh-uh, that's that, uh-uh. That's not good at all. That's well, You're evil. And they twist it all around. And they make divine establishment out to be evil when it's not. So divine establishment truth is what we should function under and we do not. Just as grace and doctrine represent the genius of God, just as grace and doctrine represent the genius of God in relationship to the human race, so evil represents the genius of Satan in relationship to the human race. Just as grace and doctrine represent the genius of God, evil Human good and evil represent the super genius of Satan. God is a greater genius. His policy is much better. You know why? His policy and his policy only involves us in as much as we accept it or reject it. Satan's policy has us involved in every aspect of it. God's policy is look here, look what I can do for you. That's God's policy. Satan's policy is, look what you can do. Look at what you can do for the world. God's policy is, look what I can do for you. The big difference. And that is why legalism is so satanic. Because legalism, in effect, says, look what I'm doing for God. No, God's done it all for you. You've done nothing for God. Who are you to think you can do anything for the Almighty God? I'll tell you who you are. You're someone functioning under human good and evil. And you're bringing this country to its knees. Legalists, believers are bringing this country to its knees. We're falling apart because we follow Satan in general 
in evil, and in human good. So the soul is the battleground of every believer in the church age. It's a battleground between the genius of God and the genius of Satan. And most believers in this client nation have gone in for what? The genius of Satan. And why have they done it? There's something appealing about the genius of Satan. You know why? It involves you. Your human good. It involves what you can do. And when people start thinking in terms of, I can do this. I can do that. I can change this. Well, then that makes them feel better. Feels a lot better than learning you can do nothing. It's a lot better than hearing you are a worthless SOB. You are depraved. You are all sinners. You are all helpless. There is nothing you can do apart from the grace of God. You are all scum. You are all the scum of the earth. You are all terrible creatures, which all of which is true. But... Even though you are so sickening and so terrible and so disgusting, and even though all your human good adds up to nothing but minstrel rags, see how gross it is? And that's what it says in the Hebrew in Isaiah 64, 6. Even though all your human good is minstrel rags, there's a solution for you, and that solution is outside of you. It is in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And you believe. And by the way, even when you believe you're doing nothing because it's God the Holy Spirit who makes it perspicuous, that is the gospel, and it's God the Holy Spirit who makes it efficacious, that is your salvation. So God's doing all the work and you're doing nothing. How about that, you losers? Which we all are. And we all start out that way. Spiritual death. Well, that's hard to swallow. Especially for someone in religion. Because the religion is filled with evil and says, you can do this and that. And you can get your way into heaven just by being good enough. That's evil. That's an evil thought. You can go to heaven by being good. That's an evil thought. That's the same thought that's found in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I can get to heaven by being good. I can go to heaven by putting a fig leaf around my loins. So that's what Adam and Eve did. They put a fig leaf around their loins. That was an act of human good. See how stupid human good is? They thought it good, and Satan thought it good, that they cover themselves. So they did so. Did it save them? No. God had to explain to them in spiritual death that now you're spiritually dead, and God the Holy Spirit had to make the gospel perspicuous to them just as he does to us, and they believed. And they believed looking forward to the cross while we believe looking back to the cross and we live in a dispensation in which we have many, many more things given to us. And to whom much is given, much is expected, which means I expect this nation to fall flat on its face. So evil is the adverse trend of society, of course. And in your soul there's a battleground between human good evil and divine good which is produced by the filling of God the Holy Spirit. There are two ways of thinking. There is first of all divine viewpoint thinking and that glorifies Christ. Divine viewpoint thinking. What is divine viewpoint thinking for the believer? Well, divine viewpoint thinking for the believer is number one. Number one truth, divine establishment. They think in terms of divine establishment. Number two, they believed in Christ, they're saved, of course. And number three, they think in terms of doctrine. In other words, they function under all three categories of truth. So they know the truth and they're free. And the truth has set them free. So divine viewpoint is thinking doctrine. And that glorifies Christ. Thinking doctrine is number three, truth. Human viewpoint is thinking evil or human good. Human viewpoint is thinking evil or human good. And that dishonors Christ. And why does it dishonor Christ? Because people say, I'm going to heaven because I'm good enough. Oh, they'll say they've accepted Christ, but then they say I'm going to heaven because I'm good enough. They'll call themselves Christians, but they're far from it. 
There are many, many, many people who call themselves Christians and are good burning in hell. They don't even have a clue. Why? They've never believed in Christ. The only thing they've done is perform human good their whole life. They fasted. Human good. It doesn't impress God not to eat. Just because you've stopped eating, that's not impressive to God. What do you think God is? A human? Yep, that's what they think. God's not impressed when someone stops eating. Go, what about in the Bible? Jesus fasted. But Jesus Christ was concentrating on doctrine of which you know none. That's what fasting all comes down to. It's, it's concentrating on doctrine so much that you miss a meal. How many people do that in the United States today? Oh, there are people who say, I fast, but how many people concentrate on doctrine so long that they miss a meal? What I'm saying is, in the ancient world, they would... Well, not really the ancient world, but that is the ancient world, but during the time of Christ and after the time of Christ, uh, some people would fast. Why? Because Jesus Christ would teach from early in the morning all the way till late at night, and they'd miss lunch. That's fasting. Why'd they miss lunch? Because he was teaching. Why else do you think the disciples got hungry? Because our Lord had been teaching so long there had been no food. And old Peter, probably a big burly guy, was standing up there and he had missed his lunch and he was getting irritated. So he wasn't really fasting. He was mad. And he came, went up to the Lord and said, What are we going to eat? Everything's about to shut down. You see, all day Peter had been fasting. How? Because he had to stand, sit there and listen to the Lord preach. You know what Peter did? Probably what a lot of people do. I've heard that before. Tuned it out. Peter needed to be listening more than anyone else. But he thought since he was in the uh, area, he thought since he was right next to the Lord, he was privileged. He thought of himself as privileged and he didn't listen too much, especially in the beginning. Later on, he got straightened out. But he didn't get straightened out until our Lord left. And then he said, and he actually wrote, he said, he basically said, I love Jesus Christ now more that he's, than now that he's gone than I did when he was here. And of course he did. He had learned some doctrine. So your love for Jesus Christ depends on doctrine. But anyway, as I was saying, uh, that's fasting. It would be as if uh, on Saturday I woke all of you up, or some of you would be up, 9 o'clock, start teaching. And I keep teaching and teaching. 12 o'clock goes by, and I keep teaching and teaching. Your stomachs start to growl, and I keep teaching and teaching. And I teach till 5, 6 o'clock, and keep on teaching. The sun sets, and I keep on teaching. What have you done? You haven't eaten. Why? You're learning doctrine. Fasting. You're not commanded to do that, by the way. And I'll never make you do it either, because I couldn't, I couldn't talk that long. But people like Paul could. People like Paul would speak so long that people would fall out of windows and die. And people have the nerve! People have the nerve to think that they don't need doctrine every day. And people have the nerve to shrug off an hour one measly hour. You know why? We are in apostasy. We're the United States of entertainment and we can't miss our little entertainment. Now can we? We got to be entertained. It's not entertaining to be chewed out by a pastor all the time, is it? No. It's not meant to be entertaining. It's meant to be edifying. It's meant for you to grow in grace and in knowledge. But in this United States of entertainment, most people can't even handle an hour a day. A measly hour. And our Lord, I showed you the schedule of our Lord from Moses on Wabiko's study. And he would get up at 5 a.m. and uh, oftentimes would teach for hours and hours and hours. Every day. Not just the Sabbat, which was Saturday. Every day. He didn't even have a house to lay his head in. So guess what? He didn't worry about any donations. He didn't have a house payment. He just walked around and gave the gospel and taught doctrine to his dumb disciples. What a life, huh? What a life. 
life that's been given to us, not in the same terms, but a life that we have a spiritual life in which well, our Lord never worried about money, now did he? He was homeless. He had no place to lay his head. And did he go around and beg for money? No. In fact, the only time our Lord mentioned money was when he was preaching and would say, you can't serve manna and the Lord at the same time. That is money. And you can't. Uh, and the, uh, another thing about money, he just turned it over in the in the temple. He went through as a very strong man and just threw the money down. And it got mixed with other people's money, and that really made people mad. You don't mess with people's money. Our Lord didn't care for money. That's obvious. He went in there and said, "You've corrupted the temple." The same things happening in churches today. They teach for 20 minutes and a whole bunch of money comes flowing out of people's pockets. Why? Because they make them feel guilty if they don't. God won't be in your life unless you give 10%. Do you want people to be, do you want God to be in your life? You better give 10%. Book of Malachi says so. Old Testament. And it, and it actually says to the treasury, which was to the Israeli government. And some people know better and still do that. So they're robbing from people. There are pastors stealing from people, giving them false hope. You'll do good in your business if you give me money. False hope. Robbing people. But surely they already have their reward. A fat wallet. And when they die, nothing! They will be ashamed in a resurrection body. And the pastor will be doubly ashamed. And if a pastor does his job, he will receive a crown none of you who do not have the gift and do not exercise it, will not have. Why? Because to whom much is given, much is expected. And whether you know it or not, there's more given to a pastor. There's more perceptive ability in that the filling of the Holy Spirit reveals things from the Bible that he does not reveal to people who don't have the gift of pastor-teacher. If that were the case, you yourself could pick it up and read a passage and uh, come up with it on your own. The Holy Spirit would say, oh, I'll tell you what that means. Now, it doesn't happen just like that. You've got to study, and you've got to correlate verses, and then while you're studying, all of a sudden, a light bulb will go off in your head, and you'll say, ding, that's it. I got it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. But it's all the work of the Holy Spirit, even though you've got to study. Study thyself to show yourself approved, and that's the pastor's. Anyway, off the beaten track for a bit, but now back to evil. Recovery from sin is an, is an instantaneous thing through the use of rebound. Recovery from sin is an instantaneous thing through the use of the rebound technique. But! Recovery from evil takes a long time. You know what evil has to do with? the wrongdoing at the end of 1 John 1 9. Sure, as soon as you rebound, you're purified from it in that you're forgiven for all the evil you committed before you named that sin. But to recover from that evil takes post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, which means for some people it means they need to rebound every minute on the minute, sometimes every second on the second because as soon as they rebound, there comes that evil flooding back in. And people don't do that because people don't have enough time to think about God enough. They don't have enough time to think, I need to be in fellowship. So they name their sin in the morning, maybe. And then by uh, 3 o'clock, they say, oh, I've been worrying all day long. Name the sin, and then at 4 o'clock, I'm worrying again. Well, I'm going to keep worrying, so forget it. I'll just name my sin at church. doesn't work that way filling of the Spirit, you should all, you should try to always be filled with the Spirit. You're not always going to be, but uh, since that's your spiritual life, it should be your number one priority to be filled with the Spirit. Now, I've said your number one priority is doctrine, but I guarantee you if you're filled with the Spirit, the number one priority is going to be doctrine for you. The Holy Spirit is your mentor and teacher, and He's going to want to teach you some things, and you're going to want to listen. If you're in the cosmic system, you're not going to want to listen. 
Oh, you can hear things and begin to understand it academically, but you're still not going to want to listen. You're going to hear things you've never heard before in your life. Correct doctrines. Absolutely correct. Absolutely phenomenal. But you won't recognize it as phenomenal because you weren't filled with the Spirit. You were carnal. You could sit there for years and be carnal and not get a thing. Why? You haven't flushed out the evil. And you still think in terms of evil and self-righteousness even though you've heard about grace and all those things. What a pathetic state to be in. So recovery from sin is instantaneous, but recovery from evil takes a long, long time. So I pity the person who gets positive toward doctrine when they're older. Even the Bible talks about it's best to do it when you're young. That way there's not that evil that you need to force out. Oh, there always is going to be some, but it's not going to be as much. It's not going to be so in inculcated. So evil is the human good panacea, and it attempts to solve all the problems of life apart from doctrine and apart from divine establishment. And believers say, well, if I only had money, all my problems would be solved. If I only were married, all my problems would be solved. No, you're just beginning your problems. If I were only this or that, my problems would be solved. If I only got a promotion, if people only liked me, my problems would be solved. If I had a lot of friends, my problems would be solved. If I had a lot of approbation, and if people just loved me, my problems would be solved. No, that's the satanic thinking. Your problems are only solved through the ten problem-solving devices. And you only get that through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. So doctrine and establishment must come first. And that's because it comes from the mind of God, the thinking of God. Divine establishment is the thinking of God. Authority is the thinking of God. Authority is the thinking of God. Our country does not understand authority in general. Specifically with many people and in general with many people. They do not understand authority whatsoever. And as a result, they don't understand divine establishment. And as a result, their children follow in their footsteps. And they wonder why. Well, you're an idiot. That's why. Why, why wonder why when you've, never, when you've never subjected yourself to authority and when all you've ever done is talk against authority, whether it be your boss, or whether it be a coach, or whether it be a pastor, or wh whatever it is. When you're constantly talking against authority, what makes, you, what makes you think your children will be immune to talking against your authority? None! There's, there's nothing there that should make you think that, but people do. Arrogance. Well, my children would never do that. There are some people that are going to be in for a big shock in their lives. Especially the young parents who have young children all throughout the country. All throughout the country. Because when the spiritual life fails among believers, it destroys their children too. When your family's dysfunctional, it's dysfunctional. And when your family's not positive toward the word, you have a dysfunctional family. That's all part of the four generation curse. And we're in it. We're down to the fourth generation curse. And what happens at the fourth generation curse? If there is no turnaround, that is if the new teenagers, that is the teenagers of today, if they do not get positive toward the word, because frankly, the older people are so arrogant, they about have no hope. That is those who aren't already positive. Those older people, they almost have no hope. They grew up in a generation of arrogance, and they're still arrogant, and they'll always be arrogant. They've almost lost all hope. But with the only thing left in this nation in terms of hope, as far as I see it, is among the teenagers. And if they get with it, and it was encouraging to see young people, not necessarily teenagers, but young people, listening to doctrine. At, uh, under Moses on Wabiko. It was encouraging to see that because that's the only hope. And they're starting out usually 
Of course, they're always going to be exposed to some evil, and they're always going to be exposed to those things, and they might have a little bit in them, but it's going to be easier for the young person to flush it out. I've seen more humility among young people because they already have it enforced. And oftentimes, it's much easier to teach young people because a young person... Usually, unless they are extraordinarily rebellious, a young person does not challenge authority directly unless they are extraordinarily rebellious. But uh, older people, they'll do it all the time. Well, I challenge you on that. I've never had a young person walk up to me and say, I challenge you on what you said. And they simply said, well, ex explain it to me or I want to learn more about that. But they've never said, I challenge you on that. There's an enforced humility. And that goes away the older you get. Unless it becomes genuine humility. And it will not become genuine humility if all your life you've been having problems with pastors. Or problems with authority. Or problems with bosses. Or problems with any authority. You're ruined. And that's part of evil, by the way. That was Satan's first sin. Rejection of authority. Rebellion, pride. I will rebel against God. I will be like the Most High God. And within us, we have an old sin nature. And within us, we could have that tendency, but once you have enough doctrine and enough genuine and enforced humility, that won't happen. If you don't like something, you know how to deal with it. You walk out quietly, without a word. People don't understand that anymore. People used to innately understand that. Even unbelievers in this country used to understand authority to the point that if they listened to something and didn't like it, they walked out and they didn't challenge it. I was listening to uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer, and he mentioned authority, and he was taught. But it was something back then you could tell he was mentioning it in passing because it was a a protocol that everyone understood. It was something that was beat into them and ingrained in their childhood. And he said the pastor told him to sing some song and to change the words, because he was the song director, and to change the words into something legalistic. And he said he did it. Because he was under the authority. Then he left. But he, he was under the authority. He didn't challenge the pastor. And he just said it in passing. He didn't even have to make a big deal out of it because that generation understood authority. A lot of them did. We don't. Ever since the 60s on, this country has gone rebellious and we are now up to the fourth generation curse. And it's evil. And Satan's dancing around because we're the fly in his ointment. If he can get rid of us, he thinks, well, now it's time for the one world order. Because guess who stands up at the UN and votes against every satanic scheme? The U.S. Well, he finally got us on his side the last time. Not that it'll happen again. It probably will. If we get another president, it'll happen all the time. Probably. We will get another president. And uh, we will probably get a bad one. It's just part of the trends of history. And the fact that People, we don't deserve to be a client nation. We are graced out in so many ways. Just because there are a few Pleroma people in, the, in this country who are keeping us from falling under the five cycles of discipline. So evil is a distortion of doctrine. It is a distortion of the laws of divine establishment. And Satan's original sin was a distortion of doctrine in that evil distorts law and order. And it substitutes evil, as in crime. And crime is high, and crime is high in this area. Anderson has a very high crime rate. Why? Rebellion! This is a rebellious area. This is a dried up place. You say, well, why would God send you to a dried up place? To emphasize, it's a dried up place. Jeremiah was sent to a dried up place. Why? To emphasize it was dried up. Why do you look confused? Well, when apostasy occurs, sometimes people just aren't going to listen. And so, But grace is grace and it still has to be taught. And people still need to be given the opportunity, even though they're dried up in their souls. 
I mean dried up in the soul, not dried up climately. It's, it, it rained today. We live in almost a tropical rainforest. It's not dry, usually. So Anderson's a dried up place. And you, you know what really blows my mind? All these churches teach uh, tithing, and if you tithe, you're going to be blessed. If that were the case, this place would be the gem of the South. Out of all the people tithing and bragging about tithing and how they're so blessed, there would be no trailer parks anymore. <laughs> and by the way, if you thought prayer was a problem-solving device, wouldn't you have prayed yourself out of some of your circumstances that you're currently living in? And I've had people almost as smart, smart aleck people. Well, do I pray about that or is, uh, uh, do I use a problem-solving device? Smart, aleck, smart alecks. I should have told just pray about it, you see. That would have been the wrong answer. <laughs> I wouldn't have told them that. But what I'm saying is you can pray about it till you're blue in the face and if it's not God's will, it's not going to happen. And if you could pray out of yourself, if you could pray yourself out of your problems, you probably wouldn't be married to the person you're married to. You wouldn't be living where you're living, and you'd have a mansion on the coast, or in the mountains, or both. Well, if you could pray yourself into any situation, well, all of us be, all of us as believers would have everything we ever wanted. We'd just pray it, and boom, there it'd be. But where would our spiritual life be? That's the important thing. Prayer is legitimate. And we've studied it. Nothing wrong with prayer. Some some nut will listen to it. Hey, he said there's something wrong with prayer before they even listen to the last part of it. Well, let them be idiots. And let them pray themselves out of their trailer parks or whatever. It's not going to work. And I'm not making fun of trailer parks, by the way. I'm sure uh, what, I'm, what I'm telling you is, if, uh, frankly, it doesn't matter. Your circumstances, if you're positive, that's what matters. I'm seriously not making fun of social status because that's not the issue. You can be poor, very poor. You can live in a tent for all I care, and if you're listening, well, you paid a lot for an MP3, but <laughs> if you're an MP3 player, we'll send you one if you're in a tent. Just write. Say, I'm in a tent, but I wouldn't even know how you'd get... Maybe you went to the library if they'd let you in. But it doesn't matter social status. That is not the issue. That's the point I'm making. The point is whether you're positive toward doctrine or not. And if you're positive toward doctrine, God may have you live in that tent for two years. Who knows? And then you may get out of the tent and move to a trailer and from a trailer to a house and then you got a pool and then something else. Or maybe you'll just stay in your trailer. Who cares? Social status is not the issue. The, status, the issue is whether you have advanced spiritually. That's the issue. But you know when people use prayer, they usually use it to ask God for something, which is an insult oftentimes. As if they go to, uh, through the uh, McDonald's line, as I've told you before. Can I take your order? Yes, $100,000. Thank you. Pull around. That'll be uh, five church Sundays. Pull around. Church Sundays. McDonald's needs to come up with that in the South. Sell a lot of them. After church, they pull up and get their church Sunday, ice cream Sunday. And they make a lot of money off the people in the South. But they're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath. Go figure that one. But it's just hypocritical. But I'm going off the deep end and talking like this. So let's continue with the fact that evil comes in many forms. Altruistic human humanitarianism. Altruistic humanitarianism. A lot of people who think, uh, well, I'll give away all my money. Altruistic humanitarianism. And, that, and that's a joke. Their altru altruistic humanitarianism is like uh, Ananias and Sapphira's altruistic humanitarianism. Meaning, oh yeah, I gave you all my money. Then they got a million dollars left in the account. Or somebody gives away twenty billion, but they got twenty billion left, and then they think they've done something and brag about it. So what? You gave away half your income. You still got twenty billion. But so that's altruistic humanitarianism, or philanthropy, religion. Religion is the devil's ace trump. Legalism, reversionism, socialism. Political internationalism. Messing with the UN. 
We're messing with the Tower of Babel. And when you mess with the Tower of Babel, you're in trouble as a nation. We're into internationalism. Our country wants the world to be on our side. Internationalism. God made nations sovereign and we're sovereign and we've handed over our sovereignty to a stupid place called the United Nations. And we, we have our hands tied not because of anything else except evil. We could blow Iran off the map but we're not going to do it. Why? Internationalism. We want the world to love us. Forget the world. You know it's the same principle as in marriage. A husband should want respect from his wife. Not necessarily love, but respect. Because if she respects him, well, that is a form of love, and that respect will be the glue to the marriage. Not love, respect. In the United States, in the same way, we want the world's love. No. What we as a client nation need is the world's respect. And how do you get respect from them Arabs? You kill a lot of them. And then those that are left bow down on their knees and say, Hooray Bush, or whoever's in power. Like they did after the first Gulf War. When we invaded, Iraqis were popping up everywhere. Hooray Bush! Bush! And waving the white flag. Suddenly they respected us! Suddenly after hearing bombs over their head night after night and probably having their eardrums blown out. Respect. But we are under evil as a nation. And we are into internationalism. We have government interference into every part of our life. We have government interference that tells us what we should do and what we should not do in our personal lives our forefathers would be rolling over in their graves. Especially old Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin up there, he's got pictures of himself smoking his pipe and having his brandy while they're going over the Constitution. He couldn't do that in the halls of Congress today. In the halls of Congress, if Benjamin Franklin were to suddenly come up from his grave and walk into the halls of Congress, he would get his brandy and his cigar thing and light it or his uh, pipe and light it up and and then he'd be kicked out. You can't do that in here. And that it would shock him, believe me, it would shock him. It doesn't shock us cuz we have been saturated with evil. Evil. Total evil in government interference. And the distortion of law bribery in government. Oh, that happens all the time. Bribery in government. Cutting the military. You know, we're actually cutting the size of the military, not the money given to it, but we're actually cutting the size of the military during the Third World War, which is what we're in. We're cutting our troop size during this Third World War. While we're having to call up reserves, we're cutting troops out. What in the world? Cutting down the military. Gun, legis gun legislation, that's not so much a big thing now, but you get a different person in office and it will be. Any type of sociology or public welfare or the common wheel, the United Nations, etc. Evil can also be a misconception of brotherly love. That's something we've gone into. We, and we go into it by saying, well, Islam is a great religion. We're trying to follow brotherly love. At any rate, what I want to get across to you is we are an evil nation now. We're a client nation, but we've fallen into evil. And the world is evil. And most believers are evil. And most unbelievers are evil today. Satan's web of deceit and deception and violence has really caught those people. And there are very, very few who stand in the gap. Very few in this country who stand in the gap. So they understand something about authority. They understand something about the importance of the Word of God. They understand something about the importance of being filled with the Spirit. And they haven't gone off the deep end 
and therefore God honors them in a very special way by keeping this very evil nation in many aspects keeping it going we don't deserve it no we definitely don't deserve it well we will continue to study evil which is Satan's policy and once we finish our study of evil as Satan's policy that will be the it for Satan some of you might say thank God I'm tired of all this <laughs> But then we'll move on to something else. But we'll still use these concepts and we'll still use these overheads because we're going to deal with Pharaoh and his hardness of heart and that's all related to it as well. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted in whose name we pray. Amen.